Welcome to Conversations with Z and Vindesh, a weekly discussion that explores common life challenges and offers practical solutions. Learn more at dharmamedia.com. That's D-H-A-R-M-A media.com. Welcome back to Conversations. Z, we're talking about burying the dead. And when we're talking about burying the dead, we're talking about burying failed ideas, putting them behind us, learning some lessons, and moving the hell on. And this is important in our environment today, because you look at society and it's just filled with, you could almost call it a failed model. I mean, if we look at outcomes, we've talked about this so many times before, from anxiety to obesity to bad health to polarization to people just struggling to survive we're engaged in a certain way of life that doesn't seem to serve us. And in fact, you could argue that it does the opposite. Instead of bringing us closer to happiness, satisfaction, relationships, things that actually mean something, the daily habits that we have, the routines that we go through, take us in the opposite direction. So a lot of the ideas that perhaps we've grown up with, that we've imbibed in the Western culture and the media, it's time to just put behind us and to say, you know what, it was a good try. Uh, maybe we did this for a while, maybe we were on the wrong path, but let's own up to our mistakes. Uh, maybe we were duped, like the investors in FTX, where you put all your money in this exchange and it disappears. Fine, let's learn on lesson, let's move on, do something else with our lives. But I think what happens a lot of times, as we've been talking about, it becomes very hard to put those ideas to rest. And it's interesting, I just mentioned FTX and the whole crypto debacle it makes me think about finance more generally because you see this behavior. I mean, actually, finance in a way is a very clean laboratory to observe human behavior. And it's very hard sometimes for people to just put the past behind them, to admit that they were wrong. And that's why people end up losing a lot of money because you get into a certain stock or you put your money with someone and it doesn't work out. And you thought a company was going to do really well. It turns out that the company is a total scam. Or even if it's not a scam, there's no demand for the product. So you buy something at $50 and it goes down to 40 it goes down to 30 And you know something isn't right, but along the way you're like, you know what, let me just hold on. I know this is going to come back. I don't want to be the sucker who sold that at 30 and then it starts going in the other direction. So let me just wait until I get my money back. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to hold on, I'm going to get my money back, and then I'm going to get out. And meanwhile, this thing collapses from 30 to 20 to 0 and suddenly all your money has disappeared. I know people have done this with stocks like AMC and GameStop. Uh, they've done this with Bitcoin. Uh, it's a pretty common phenomenon. And in finance, it's very clear, but the same principle applies more generally, where we've got certain habits, certain ways of doing things. You can think about relationships, the way that we interact with family. And it, maybe we go into certain discussions, and we always come out arguing with the same people in our family about the same things. And we think, okay, well, this time it's going to be different. This time they're going to see my point of view. Uh, they've got to be more mature. They've got to behave differently. But it never happens. And we fall into the same trap over and over. Or relationships. There are a lot of examples in today's day and age where people are just having trouble connecting with others, uh, finding relationships. And maybe it's because you keep on using dating apps instead of meeting people in real life. Or Z, as you said, you go into a relationship and you've got a ton of of check boxes that you need to tick off. So you want a person with a certain height, certain weight, certain educational background, certain income, uh, and it's just too many conditions. Uh, but instead of saying, okay, maybe I need to work on myself, uh, improve myself, or maybe I need to drop some of these conditions, you keep on going out there with the same strategy. And like the person who just beats their head against a wall, eventually you're going to fail. You're going to knock yourself unconscious. So we see this over and over again. Uh, we see it in politics. I'll, I'll mention one final example where we look at politicians and really over the last 20 years, not that politicians have ever been so upstanding, but the level of, of corruption, of depravity, of self-interest has increased to a degree that I never would have imagined. You look at someone like George Santos, who's been in the news, who lied about every single aspect of his background lied about being Jewish, lied about his educational background. I was going to send you an article today. I actually came across this. Uh, I think it was in 2013. He stole $3,000 from a GoFundMe campaign for someone's dog. <laughs> Just 
<laughs> just a bizarre bit of news. But he told this person that he would help raise money for a dog's operation. He ran off with the money. So pathological liar, but he's in Congress and it doesn't look like he's going anywhere. Maybe he will. I don't know. But so far, he hasn't gone anywhere. But we want to believe, right? We want to believe that the system works. We want to believe that politicians ultimately will do the right thing. Or you've just got a few bad apples and it's not endemic. It's not a reflection on the system. Uh, but at some point, you got to just wake up or step back and even maybe waking up is the wrong term, but but step back and look objectively, put history aside and really say, what is going on right now? I mean, forget about where I'm coming from. Forget about what I used to do. Forget about what may have worked in a certain time. What is the reality today? And are the things that I'm doing, are the ideas that I have serving my best interests? If not, it's time to put them to bed. As we say, it's time to bury the dead. Uh, let's just get them out of the way, clear that path, move forward. Life will be a lot simpler. We'll feel better. We'll drop the anxiety. And as we've talked about, anxiety becomes a, a very big issue that uh, sometimes takes over our entire life, uh, just dealing with all of these machinations in our mind. Uh, so, Z, that's the the territory that we're going to cover today. Why don't you kick us off? Just give us some examples. I mean, I gave you some thoughts. What are your thoughts on this concept of failed ideas and really being able to bury the dead and move on. I like to cover it in a way that, for those of us who listen and opt outs, can really fashion it in their own minds the way they work with it. So we have funeral rituals. We have all sorts of mourning rituals in different cultures on how to lay the dead to rest so you can get on with your life. Whenever you have a death of any kind, um, and especially if you have a, a close attachment to that, it's very difficult. Grieving is very difficult because it's hard to see your world without that person, that idea of that person, the hopes, the projections on the future, the sentiments of the past. And so the grieving process can be one of the most difficult processes you go through in life. And so we have created mourning rituals to free the soul, letting go of birds, letting butterflies fly away. Uh, letting the funeral pyre go out, um, the casket being lowered and the first bit of dirt being rose over the grave. So there can be a sense of finality that allows you to begin and move on without that part of the, your, your idea about life. So we have these rituals and we, we want to take it and have a more holistic ritual in our life of burying the dead. As you said, burying failed ideas, things that aren't going to change, they're not going to work out the way you want. How do I just bury that, let it go, and move on and, and, and grow from it, reflect upon it for a moment, but not be so caught up in it that I'm lying in the grave or I'm committing satya, like in ancient times, into where the woman would just jump on the funeral pyre with her husband and burn herself to death because there was nothing left for her other than, than, than serving him. And when he's gone, there's no reason to be alive. Well, if you still have a reason to be alive and a reason to face life, we have to learn how to do those personal rituals. You were talking about a few things, and I want to, I, I oftentimes reflect upon um, our, our moment right now and what's going on in the world, which is, uh, is, is really about opening your eyes and seeing what's going on. Humanity has been through many ups and downs, and we have the ability to measure and mark different milestones in humanity in reflection. We have now enough records, at least in our era, to know how things will turn out. When it comes to societal things, as you were talking about, there's some politician that's doing what politicians do. Uh, he is amoral, unprincipled, over-ornamented, like the nation itself. He stands for nothing but himself. But people are justifying his position because he's in their party, which is undermining the whole idea of a United States. But people don't care because he's in their party and he can push an idea or an agenda, which he won't do that. He will continue. Anybody that steals money from sick dogs and then fabricates every imaginable thing, but some way you see that there are redeeming qualities you can use, what does that say about you? where you have failed as a human being. 
Then we look at social situations where I was showing Caitlin something today where there was some statistic that it looked like on these dating websites that something like 80% of the women go after 10% of the men on these dating sites. This is what the algorithm has shown. So 80% of the women are pursuing 10% of those men that are on dating sites. So there are 100 men on a dating site, 100 women on a dating site, and those 80 of those 100 men are going after 10 of the men on there, leaving 20% of the women to go through whatever's left over if they care to do it. And so then you go to crime statistics and what's going on, this new phenomena of not only being, uh, what do they call it, uh, uh, fish catted or something, uh, what's it called, Kate? Okay. Uh, where they fish cat people or something? Are they fake. Catfish. Yeah. Okay. So there's these people that are catfish, but now it's it's led up to crimes: stealing your money, murdering, taking your stuff, kidnap and torture. So these women are making themselves available to the ideal men. These men that that, that feed into the mal thought of women. They say, I, I I want a guy to be all these things, and because. I'm deserving. I want a guy that's a multi-millionaire, that's seven foot two, only looks at me, totally fit, um, reads poetry every night, and he just wants to hang out with me all day, and um, he can overlook all my flaws, though I won't overlook any of his. And so this is what you get. But there's no voice out there saying, hey, this is a failed idea. This is a failed idea, like our politics it's failed. It's over. It doesn't work. The system has failed you. And if you continue to stand by the grave, nothing will come out of there. And in your worst nightmare, the person will be zombified. And now you have the zombie apocalypse. Okay? But the reality of it is, it, th this is a dead idea. It doesn't work anymore. You have people that are, are concerned about the justice system. It is a failed system because there's no judicial oversight there's still qualified immunity, so you will never have justice. So you want to avoid the system, not participate in it. The financial system is a paper tiger now. So those who are thinking are figuring out ways, okay, when this thing winds down, where, where do I want to stand? What resources and skills do I have to weather the barren times that will inevitably come because of the collective behavior of people who are still holding on to the, the, the kind of the holding on to the side uh, rails of the Titanic as it's going down. They're hoping that it will float back up. We have to figure out ways of navigating through this and be more skilled at self-sustaining, self-preservation self and living and still being civil. So that is about abandoning failed ideas. Um, when it comes to our general health, uh, a, a wonderful family was asking me uh, about their health and things they want to do. And as they started exploring their health, they said, my God, there's so many pitfalls out there. See, uh, they, had these, uh, they, they were serving our kids flaming hot Cheetos at uh, school and come to find out there was uh, antifreeze and uh, all sorts of paint, lacquer preservatives in Flaming Hot Cheetos that make them Flaming Hot. So what do we do? You know, we're going to educate our kids, but it's everywhere. You have bizarre dyes in food that have shown to have adverse effect on hormonal uh, stability in children. And, and what do you do? What do you do? And I said, you must be like a guerrilla fighter fighting a conventional war. You don't try and meet them bomb for bomb, tank for tank, gun for gun. You maneuver yourself at night. You take quiet paths. You, you burrow through. You go under and you go around so that you don't have these huge confrontations. So when it comes to caring for your family's health, you are ever diligent. Where you shopped at last week may have been bought up, might have introduced the GMOs, and the lacquered foods or <coughs> excuse me, or the overly preserved something something. And now that they said that if something has one third or one fourth organic in it, it can be labeled organic. 
So you now you can't trust the labeling. You have to really do your sourcing, be somewhat investigative, plan ahead. But you can do it, and if it becomes part of who you are, it doesn't take that much more energy. They have many resources that are sitting right next to things that aren't working. So right next to the genetically modified blueberry is the smaller regular blueberry that, that is a little smaller and costs a little more. Go with that one and you will save in the long run. Learn how to navigate when it comes to your mental health. Uh, one of the things that's causing a lot of this kind of emotional breakdown of people, these nervous breakdowns you're seeing a lot more with people, is people are trying to make sense of things that don't make sense. Things you should really bury. And, and, and because we live in a world where science is trumped by feelings, facts and truth is offensive, um, you, you want to not be a part of it. And the hard part is, is that you want it to be a part of that. You want it to hang out with that energy, but it's dead. It, it, it has no life in it. So have a funeral for it and then move on. It's kind of like you're in a high casual event. There was a story about a woman who was a lone survivor in an airplane crash. And she was, they were flying somewhere. Uh, the plane slams into a mountain. She, she wakes up. Her husband is, is dead next to her on a seat sitting kind of next to her and on top of her. She's broken her back, broken her back. She can't move. And all she can do is kind of wait while all these corpses are sitting around. She's up on a mountain. It rains. She drinks rainwater running off the seat over the back of her dead husband. She sits there for eight or nine days. The way she did it, whenever she would go into deep emotion or emotions or she would go into these uh, uh, very deep states of fear and depression, she would begin to do breathing exercise. That's what she said. She would just do breathing exercise. She learned in yoga, the pranayama or qigong or something. She would just do the exercises and then she would just wait for whatever came about. She, each breath in, she was alive. Each breath out was a new opportunity for a new breath. That's what she told herself. For eight days, eight days later, the recovery crew had spotted the plane. They came up to collect dead bodies. They found her. She breathed. She buried the dead and she breathed. She just worked on her breathing because it kept her mind present so she could navigate the pain navigate the grief and the loss. It took her some time to completely recover from her injuries. She went on to have children and a life, got remarried, blah, 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 and life was waiting for her on the other side. So this is a great tragedy. A lot of times what we're dealing with societally is a great tragedy. It's a sad story, the state of many things. And when you look at some of the stuff during the, this, the rise of the machine, and during the time of volatile consumerism. And so much is made plain, just like that politician is plainly a habitual sociopathic liar. Yet he has an audience of people that will justify his behavior thinking it is the means to an end. It is a means to an end, the end of your ideas. That's what's the end of. You want to pull yourself out of that. Pour yourself out of the crowd. Pour yourself out of the herd. And then navigate quietly around all of this by breathing. Maintaining yourself. Take that breath that brings in clarity. Take that pause for a moment. I always say go back to gratitude. Think, thank God I'm okay. Right? Like Caitlin is finally um, getting to a place where she's like, I treat my boyfriend well. She used to treat him like dirt. And then she realized when she started looking around and seeing the tender thing and all this, she said, you know, I got it good. Actually, I got it better than good. I got a guy that loves me, cares about it, and all he really wants me to do is act like I care. So she, she's figured it out. She didn't want to do that at first, right? She didn't want to do that. So now she, figured, she sees, reaps the benefit. I heard him on a little funny conversation. They sound like old married couple now. Uh, at peace, there's contentment. This is as good as gifts. When, we, when we, we start to opt out of this and we start to bury our dead, our life gets a lot better because there's an opportunity to breathe and have new beginnings. Don't try to revive the dead. 
these myths of rising dead people, these are myths. Not only are they the zombie myth, the Jesus myth, it's all a myth. It's okay. I enjoy a zombie movie like anybody else, but it's not real. What's real is what's in front of you. And when you lose that hope or that idea, that doesn't mean life is over. That means, okay, new plans. Let's reset. Let's readjust. Let's navigate. I want to stay healthy, but the trend is to be unhealthy. So I, and physically. That's right. So I won't be part of the trend. Uh, now they have this kind of posturing your mental health disease. What's that called where people just quote their mental disease and it's become trendy? Mm -hmm. I, I won't be a part of that. I'm going to have a funeral for that and move on. I'm going to have a funeral for all these different people's um, uh, sexual things. What was the newest thing, Caitlin? Um, uh, the, what, what was the newest thing we were talking about? Uh, uh, trans ableism. Oh, yes. So now that people have been mutilating themselves to express their uh, sexual preference, now you have people who want to remove arms and limbs to appear to be <clears throat> disabled because they feel inside they're disabled. Uh, look, I, I won't be a part of any of this. A woman, I think, chose to get blinded. Right, and right. She had to find a physician who... Would blind her, and I think she ended up playing drain on her eyes or something. Yeah. Yeah, so all power to you. I won't be there. I'll have a funeral for that. Uh, your eyes will probably go bad anyway, even if you do everything right. I, try to, I suggest you take Lutins. Um, there's um, uh, Lanoprost. That's really good eye drops that help reduce... Octo, the pressure in your eyes so you won't get glaucoma. So I'm using all that stuff because I really like seeing. But if you don't, I'm going to have a funeral for your party and I just won't be there. I'm going to let you go. Go do your thing. Knock yourself out. Let me just navigate. For those of you who are going through um, um, relationship stuff, like most of us ups and downs relationship stuff, one of the things that cures relationship stuff, like Kaylin did, is just surrender. You don't want to be on the... Uh, the, 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 the thing, the, the, what's the thing that you're swiping left, swiping right? Tinder. You, you don't want to be on Tinder. You don't want to find yourself on Tinder. The odds are very slim. I mean, my, 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 my son met my daughter-in-law on Tinder, but that was way in the beginning, I think. I don't know if it's any better or worse. Um, I just think it's how you use it. Yeah, but again, what, what's the, what the algorithm says is 80% of the women are going after 10% of the men on there. And the 10% of the men, uh, a lot of them are highly involved in criminal behavior, robbing, uh, doing weird stuff to these women. But they have filled out the checklist so that they get the women there. They do the checklist, right, just right. And uh, I saw one, I guess it was a real one, where the woman was asking, she said, well, you didn't put your height on the Tinder thing. And he says, oh, well, I'm 6'5". And he said, by the way, how much do you weigh? And she said, I find that insulting. It was okay for Aaron to ask him the height, but he couldn't ask her her weight. Isn't that interesting? Let's just have a funeral for the madness and move on. <laughs> don't, don't stay there and hang out with the rotting corpse. Okay? Avoid politics. It's a rotting corpse. Right? And for those of you who are social justice warriors and want things right, Pick one battle at a time, see what you're up against, and deal with that. For those people who are looking for uh, the whole you know, police reforms and all that kind of stuff, it, it will not come unless there's a catastrophic event in this country until you get judicial reform. Uh, you, have some kind of, you have no judicial oversight, and you have qualified immunity. So things are going to just keep getting worse and worse until you figure out a way to bury that idea that it's going to change and find other ways to live, uh, find yourself with a less frequency of encounter with all this kind of mad, try to stay out of the legal system as much as you can, uh, park into, just anything you can avoid. It's a failed thing, and anything that draws you in, you will stink of the rot of that corpse. You follow what I'm saying, Vin? Yeah, you certainly don't want to be around a rotting corpse. <laughs> I, lo I love that visual, because it just feels so appropriate. That, and that's how we live. We just carry these these corpses around, and they're a burden. They're heavy. They stink. They got flies. They make us miserable. But we can't let them go for whatever reason. We, we can't leave them behind. Uh, so I just find that that's so fitting 
Uh, what's interesting to me is why we have such trouble letting this stuff go. And I'll give you an example. So the other day I was talking to someone who was a journalist for a long time. And this person was telling me that, oh, you got to go and read the Twitter files. So do you know about the Twitter files, the stuff that Elon Musk released about how? It, okay, so it, it was all these internal Twitter documents. It, basically, the government was pressuring Twitter to censor certain points of view and certain news stories and clear violation of uh, First Amendment Clear government involvement in terms of what public discourse is allowed to be or not allowed to be. And so there were 140 pages of these Twitter files that came out. And this person I was talking to was just shocked about this and was saying, yeah, if you care about the First Amendment, you care about the Constitution, you got to read this thing. It's incredible. And I was thinking to myself, you know, on the one hand, it isn't incredible. But on the other hand, why is this surprising? I mean, we've known this for such a long time. Like this idea about free speech itself. It should have been buried a long time ago. We went through this after the Iraq war. We've gone through this. There was that book that David Nick recommended. I'm forgetting who wrote it, the famous person, but I can't remember the name for some reason. But this was written 20 years ago, and and they basically talk about how news is a big business, and it's co-opted by the government. It's co-opted by the wealthy. And if you have newspapers who are looking to put out articles, and that's their business, they're going to go to the sources which make their lives easy, where they don't have to invest a lot of time doing reporting and gathering information that no one else has. If you go to the Pentagon and they give you a nice press kit with all the information and all the quotes and they do their job for you, then all you got to do is put that down and you can cite some authoritative source and then you're done. Uh, So that problem has been around forever. Uh, And of course, it's gotten worse in the age of social media. I've seen it at a personal level. Certain things that I put online are, are, are shut down. You get strikes on YouTube. There's certain things in Facebook that you're just not allowed to talk about. But this guy, this journalist, who presumably is very aware of what goes on in journalism, was shocked by the Twitter files. And I'm just kind of thinking, yeah, I mean, it's maybe at odds with the Constitution or the intention of this country, the way it was envisioned hundreds of years ago. But why is that a surprise? I mean, that's the world that we live in. And it's been that way for a while Uh, We can look at Russia, Ukraine. We've talked about this before, Z, where you've had people who were fired from their jobs because they would not come out and condemn Russia, which I find even more egregious. Uh, There, it's not even about what you're allowed to say. It's what you have to say. Uh, So we're forcing you to say something. We're forcing you to take a point of view. Otherwise, we're kicking you out of your position. You you can't be a, a ballerina or a conductor anymore. Uh, so I don't know why uh, that's just an example, but I think it's an example of what you're talking about. You know, this ideal that we have that free press is so important that uh, this country is not like China or Russia or Iran, where dissenting points of view are censored. No, we're different. We're special. And maybe in some ways we are. I'm not saying that it's exactly the same system, uh, but if for some reason we're reluctant to give up on that idea. You talk about the police. I think a lot of the objection to uh, movements like defund the police and uh, and so forth. And a lot of the pushback that you see is just a refusal to accept what you're talking about, uh, which is you've got police departments with no oversight, with qualified immunity, uh, where in some cases like the LAPD, uh, you've got white supremacist gangs who are operating uh, within the police force itself. But people don't want to talk about it because they just can't accept it. It's like, no, this isn't reality. This is too far away from the ideals that I've grown up with. And maybe this gets back to our identity, uh, which I think we talked about on one of the previous podcasts. You you know, and and it's interesting, Z, because it's a point that's occurring to me right now. I didn't think of this when we started the conversation. But maybe the reason it's so hard to let go of these failed ideas is that they become a part of ourselves in a very real way. So it's not just things that we're used to doing. It's worse than habit. I mean, it would be one thing if it were just habit and we're too lazy to change it. And then you say, OK, well, maybe I can critically examine the world around me and I'm willing to make some changes because I'm at the point where I'm experiencing pain. My life is hard. I want to make my life easier so I can opt out. But I think the challenge and I want your perspective on this, if these ideas, if that dead body becomes part of ourselves, <laughs> you know, so you can think of it. I mean, this is a disgusting analogy, but you've got a rotting corpse and suddenly it becomes your conjoined twin. And that's who you are. So you look at yourself in the mirror, and suddenly you're no longer who you were, but you're this this freak of nature with two heads and four limbs or, or four arms. 
And even though you smell all the time, that's who you are and you're comfortable with that and you feel good about that. And you've joined a group of other people who look just like you and you're proud of who you are and you, you get a lot of personal satisfaction from being in this group, holding on to these ideas, operating in a certain way. That becomes very hard to get rid of. It's like cutting off a body part. You know, it's uh, how do you amputate part of your soul uh, if your identity is crafted from ideas, even if those ideas have failed? Uh, so maybe that's where some of the challenge comes in. Uh, but uh, give me your thoughts on that. Well, Vin, there, there's a lot to unravel from that. And, and again, I, I love the visual. And when you think about our attachments have a lot to do with what where we're going with this is when we talked about grieving, um, anybody who's been through grief, we just had Smacy, and you know his daughter was murdered. He was on the uh, Forgiveness Project. And he's just my hero, the fact that he could move forward from that. I don't like to say move on, but he could move forward from that. And he showed me the brochure, the 25th anniversary of his organization. It took a lot not to um, shed a tear, having remembered his daughter, remember him. But he, him, it, it's changed my relationship with him. Because he's, he, he buried his dead, he moved on, he even went so far as to truly forgive the young man that murdered his daughter. Um, but when we tie that into social modeling and being well and getting through this, we have to know what we have to cut off. It's like you, you made the metaphor of, of carrying around a parasitic Siamese twin that one is dead, one is living and it's draining the life of that. It's no different in physiology when you have gangrene. You have a limb that's gone bad. You have a necrotic limb. And there are people who want to save that limb, and they don't want to lose that limb. And it requires blood, it requires energy, it requires all those things, but it's constantly draining you. Um, I remember when I worked in the music business, there was a guy in a group called Two Live Crew, and he had damaged his arm, and he didn't want to get his arm cut off, so he would just carry this dead limb in a sling and over the years it became more and more atrophied and going to find out that it may have ended up being the cause of his death later on because he didn't want to let it go he didn't want to be the one-armed guy and for that reason he kept that limb until it consumed his whole body and if you look at some of the old two live crew videos you'll see him walking around with a cast on his arm uh, and the limb was just there it was nerve damage it, it was it was dry. Every time you saw him, it was skinnier, it was dried up, it had no nerve sensation in it, but it was still draining his body. And that's what we do when we lock ourselves into failed notions about whatever it is. The remedy is to, is again, have your own mourning ritual. Whatever that funeral is, be it a, a, a day, a week, or whatever, but be able to move forward. Um, we have a lot of things going on in our society that are measurably damaging our health, our mental health, our physical health. Let us look at it, memorialize it as a lesson, and move forward. And the ancients gave us the tool, gratitude for what you have, gratitude for what you had, and move forward and let it be something that launches you into a higher vibration. Subjugate the ego like you might have put a lot into it and it didn't work out. You put so much into it and it didn't work out. And you see where people go with that, like with you have failed politicians and people hanging on to this failed politician as he's going down and, and they're, they're fighting for it and they're hoping for a revival of it. No, it's dead. It, you, there's, it, it's coded. We can't do anything for it. But in the areas where you can do something from, you don't want to carry that parasite around that's draining you. If you let it go, then that offers new growth, new opportunity. I think that every day we have an opportunity to flourish. Yet every day, too, we have an opportunity to hold on to failed ideas that drain any new thing from us. That applies to everything, especially when you attach sentimental value to it. And since sentimental value cannot be um, 
it, it, it can't be measured in a, in a normal kind of transactional metric, it is very problematic. You got to let things go. It's like a hoarder, you know, we, that, that hoard. And then I'll use myself every weekend. I think I'm going to go through my closet and throw away half my stuff. And every weekend it goes by that I do it, I can see the clutter. I see it. I feel it. And it drains your ideas. It drains your alertness. It drains your lucidity. It drains your creativity. So let's start packing those bags and throwing them away. And then what happens with sentiment is really, sentiment is really weird because you have a good plan. You say, I'm going to just throw this out. Then you say, but it's such nice stuff. I want to give it to somebody because I want to see their smile. I want to see their face. I want to, what do you call it? Um, I, I want a social posture to show that I'm a giving good person. I want people to acknowledge that I gave this away. So that becomes another attachment. So let that go so that you can breathe, so that there can be fresh air moving through your mind and through the ideas in your mind. You can have a freshness. So we have to pack up the excess and throw it away. Also, control the sentiment so that the sentiment of the moment doesn't have you reattaching yourself to things that are useless in your life or that aren't bringing you the bounty that you would like it to have. Don't be a hoarder, a hoarder of failed notions and ideas, a hoarder of poor health. I spoke to a young lady the other day that has gained uh, almost 100 pounds in weight uh, since the passing of her mom. And I told her the things to do, and, and, and she said, well, the, the grief, the work, I just, I go to work and I just sit home and eat and snack. And I just, I drown myself in, in low pleasantries of carbs, sugar, and fat. Because I'm so busy, I'm so work, I have no life. And you know what? If you don't bury that, you never will have a life. So you want to accept that this isn't working for me. And I have to bury that. It's how you begin. The first step into taking care of your health is to acknowledge that wherever you're at isn't where you want to be. Have the, you don't want to be in the graveyard of the self. So that's just following up on that, Vin. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective, Z, because it ties into another topic that we're thinking about today, uh, this idea of rock bottom. And a lot of times people can't change and we're so, I don't know what it is. I mean, either so blind or we're caught up in these false ideas to such an extent that we just keep on going, going, going. And you put it a, a certain way, which I thought was exactly right. Because uh, I've actually heard people use these same terms, which is I just got to plow through it or I just got to make it work. If I try hard enough, I can turn things around. If enough time passes, things are going to get better. I've seen people, uh, family, friends in these types of situations where they're doing things, whether it's relationships or it's uh, just behaviors, the way they manage their lives, it's not working. Uh, but they feel like, I just got to give it some more effort. I just got to keep on trying and I'll get through this. In fact, for a lot of my life, I felt that way. I didn't even realize I was doing this, but in retrospect, I was. Uh, where I didn't feel good about myself. And every time I would talk to people about it, the answer would always be, well, you just have to it's kind of like, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you able to appreciate what you have? And not that I wasn't grateful, but I just wasn't living in the right way. And finally, I had to make some change. But all this stuff, I mean, every single time I've seen people make a big shift in their lives, it comes down to a certain amount of pain. What that threshold is, it might differ depending on the person. So for some people, maybe it's just an extended depression or malaise others maybe it's the sharp pain of a breakup others maybe it's substance abuse and uh, you end up waking up in some alley uh, without your pants and cocaine smeared across your face it, it, whatever the case is you get to a point where you're shaken up you're embarrassed you realize that things aren't working and that gives you the energy you know that's like the the spark that lights that fire that allows you to then go forward z and make those changes and maybe do some of the things we're talking about, where you take a more critical look at your life, you start getting outside perspectives, you say, okay, this isn't working. If this isn't working, I need to substitute a certain pattern with a different pattern, a different behavior. Let me educate myself. Uh, let me go through whatever ritual I need to do to bury the dead and move forward. But as we talked about offline, 
a lot of times it takes hitting that point of rock bottom uh, before you're actually willing to make that change. And in fact, we've also talked in different contexts about how if you're not at that point, if you're not willing to make a change, it doesn't matter what anyone else does. There's almost no point talking to someone and trying to talk them into changing their ideas uh, to burying these false narratives unless they're looking for guidance and they're looking to make a change uh, because otherwise you, you get defensiveness. You get people who are pissed off. The whole thing erupts. It ends up in conflict. Nothing changes. Everyone's worse off. So it, uh, help our audience understand that, um, you know, because we've talked about some of these rituals around burying the dead. But what is the role of pain and the role of hitting rock bottom? And maybe is there a way to mitigate that? You know, if we think about techniques uh, to get rid of these failed ideas, what can we do so we do it as efficiently as possible without getting to a point where we're just totally in despair and we're throwing our hands up and, and praying for salvation? Well, one of the things about pain and hitting rock bottom is it brings you into the moment. And in that moment, it's just like uh, re rituals of, of pain and se religious self-flagellation. Even the old rituals of baptism, uh, which were conditioning the person to religion, where you take a person to the edge of drowning. And when the person comes up for air, they say, now do you believe in God? Of course, I, I can breathe. I, I just needed air. And they associate drowning and that pain within a religious awakening, finding a moment, and then they, the reward is the air. So you think about where that ritual came from. You think about the drug addict or whoever, who it isn't the, uh, the despair they caused others or the suffering or the criminality of it. It is when they could no longer endure themselves, but there was a, there was a, there was a light in them that wanted to live. I want to live. But they couldn't feel that. They couldn't sense that light. They couldn't see the glow of it until the darkness was all around them, till death was right there. There are people who are just not on the right track in their life. And eventually they find themselves overwhelmed, exhausted, disconnected. Uh, they, they don't feel numb. They feel the pain of living. And they'll say, I can't do this anymore. It's like the old thing when you were a kid and somebody would twist your arm. You say, you, I'm going to twist your arm until you say uncle. Most people would say uncle. Um, they had to go on and break my arm, but I, I was just that guy. But there's a, there's a role that plays where when we find ourselves completely in the moment, and the next moment that we intentionally make has to be better than the last moment that we acknowledged. And the hindrance to that is oftentimes when people have safety nets. That's why when you see people who have a lot of support, they often go further and further into the abyss of making bad decisions because someone catches them every which way they are. When you read the forensics on criminality, you see that criminals who have a loving family or a lot of support tend to do more harm than someone who has nothing. It's, regrettably, that's a reality of it, especially when it comes to very socially disturbed crimes. Disturbing crimes, the people that do the worst tend to have the most support, not what you would think, someone with no support. The people often with no support have little. They're really working and they show gratitude for everything they have. And so it's, it's a hard one. So when we hit rock bottom, pain awakens us. Not comfort. Comfort puts us to sleep. Pain puts us to work. You follow me, Vin? Yeah, it's interesting, uh, this concept of being present and this idea of having support. Because... Uh, we don't want to advocate, or at least I wouldn't. I don't know what your view is, but it, usually you would think of having a loving family, having resources, financial resources around as a good thing. But you're right. It can lead you to a path where you don't have to take ownership of yourself, where you know that someone else is going to bail you out. And maybe you start expecting that. 
So if we summarize some of the things that we've talked about, because I want to turn this into practical tools that people can use, how do we actually go about burying the dead? The first thing is we want to recognize what the failed ideas are. And to do that, we've got to be present. And part of that process of being present is about taking ownership. So whether we're struggling to survive and we're on our own, or we happen to have a lot of resources, in either case, it's a different mindset. We're not expecting that someone else is going to take care of us. We're not expecting that the world is going to bail us out. The system is going to bail us out. Things are just going to work out because they've worked out. It's really an idea that we are responsible for ourselves in this world, for the choices we make, for our own survival, for uh, being able to deal with whatever hardships life throws our way. And with that mindset, maybe that's what brings us to the present. So once we're in that moment, we're accountable, we're aware of what's going on, then we can say, okay, now I can take an objective look at what's working, what's not working, and I can go through my rituals of burying the dead. And those rituals, uh, talk us through those rituals, because we alluded to them earlier, but I think this is the final piece uh, of this process. And it, it, to me, may, maybe the most important, where we want to be able to, to put this behind us. In certain cultures, as you mentioned, there's a grieving period. Uh, so if you lose someone who's very close to you, Maybe you grieve for a week or you grieve for a month, and then after that, you got to move on with your life. Uh, I was having a discussion with my wife today. We were talking about uh, someone very close to us, and she was saying they've just got to accept. They've just got to accept what is and move on because uh, they keep on fighting reality, and that leads to more and more pain. Uh, So I, I do feel like that ritual of bearing these ideas is critical, but walk us through the mechanics. How do we actually do that? Well, we can learn from the existing rituals of dealing with mortality. And then we can use that as a metaphor or a metaphorical lesson for as we plan. So let us think about mortality. You get the call that someone dear to you has passed away. The first is the initial denial. Let's go through every phase. The denial. I don't want to believe it. It's not true. People always say, I thought it was a joke, a mistake. Well, then there is the acceptance. You go and view the body. Yeah, that they're dead. Um, then you begin the kind of the vomiting up the memories. All the time, the relationship, the acceptance phase, right? You accept. Now you go through the disposal phase. We must now wash, drape, discard the remains. And one of the rituals, I know at least in my culture, many cultures, is the prepping of the body for destruction, be it burning or burying. So you wash the person, you groom them up. And what that's doing, that's not for the dead. They don't care whether they're shaved or their hair is done. They don't care. It's for you to feel What used to be warm and real is now porcelain-like, decaying rather quickly, stiff, with no warmth at all, with no breath, only the shadow of the image. And then that allows you to have a realization and going further into the acceptance process is that those are the remains of their loved one. That is the physical remains, but it is not the memory or the love for that person because that exists in eternity. And then you start to embrace eternity as you dispose of the remains. The day goes on, the clock keeps ticking, and now you plot a new path, but also you reflect and say, you know, I, there's a lot of things I could have said. There's a lot of paperwork we could have done. There was a lot of Things we could have said, I'm going to do that in the future. When I move forward, I'm going to do whatever I didn't do here. I'm going to learn from that. Hopefully that's a holistic way of dealing with it. And then you have the remembrance. And the remembrance is also a part of that infusion of the lesson that you got from that person or that event. So in our everyday life, 
we reflect upon the dead around us, the, 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 the dead ideas about politics or society or even common sense. We have a funeral for common sense. And we don't just keep hovering around and swatting the flies away and trying to put um, deodorant packs on the rotting corpse of common sense. People don't have that. That's, that doesn't exist anymore. That died uh, at the beginning of, the last, of this century. It's, it's gone. At the end of the last century, common sense died. So don't expect people to have that. And you'll be much more, uh, uh, you'll be much happier. Okay? Then you think about how that applies to people's decision making and health issues. You realize that I have to be a bit more studied. I, I have to be a bit more intellectual with um, social constructs of government and all that. You see, okay, this is failed. So how can I avoid this altogether? I'm not going to wear flags uh, of different kinds. I'm not going to put posters on my lawn. I'm just going to kind of stay out of it. I'm not going to wave either a Union Jack or a rainbow flag. I'm not going to do any of it. I'm not going to put up the Russian flag or the Ukrainian flag. I'm going to just really observe and see how these things pan out. And um, I'm just going to make sure that my, I'm okay and my family's okay. And I'm going to get with like-minded people who support me. I'm going to nurture those relationships just as I nurture my home garden. And that's really the rules we want to use. So we can, we can take from the metaphor of managing the dead from every culture and use that as a way of moving forward with our own life. So either burying the dead, burning the dead, whatever you do, accepting that they're dead or that it's dead, this idea. And you'll find that you're, the, the burden of living is, is much less. We see the mental illnesses in our cities, right? The huge tent cities, which is a reflection upon a societal failure. We are part of that society. We have bought into that society. I would say, how do we really focus on divesting from that so that we can be okay. So you're, you're going to explore new avenues of commerce, of the human commerce, of material commerce, um, being a bit more frugal with your energy, a bit more discriminatory of how you spend your time because your time is the most valuable thing you have. So you're going to be really careful about how you spend your time, right? And then you also know that you can extract a lot out of your time. Look, a good, you can do a good workout every day and it takes 30 to 45 minutes to do a really good life-changing exercise. You can walk for one hour a day and you could change the trajectory of your heartbeat. You can take 10 more minutes at the grocery store sourcing your food and that will give you more time. You will make that 10 minutes back by being a healthier, more vibrant person. You can avoid um, these kind of pitfalls of the uh, internet and things like that by actually talking to people, interacting face-to-face -face with people, feeling uh, the exchange of vasopressin, oxytocin, the pheromones that you'll experience when you actually sit and talk with another human being as opposed to interneting them and textogramming and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so you want to check yourself. Remember that when you're on there and you're in that portal, that is not real. People aren't sitting around all day in Lamborghinis venting and talking about their view of the world. These are not scholars. None of these people are even scholarly. They have, they're not well read. They're able to talk and main talk all day. That doesn't make you smart. That doesn't make you knowledgeable. Yeah, there are tricky and catchy memes on there but accept it as entertainment. It is entertainment. It's monkey business. It's the circus. It's a freak show. Enjoy it, but always call it what it is. And you will find that it takes a tremendous burden off of you so that you can be healthy and well. Yeah, having that clarity, Z, I think is critical. I mean, to me, that's the most important thing we can do in these times if we want to enjoy our life, if we want to achieve something, evolve, uh, anything. I mean, relating to other people, going to work, working in a big company, uh, dealing with people who cut you off in traffic, 
All of this requires a life strategy, and that life strategy depends on how things actually are, what the conditions are out in the field. So being able to see things clearly as they are, get rid of old ideas or false ideas, recognize that the world is changing, what worked 20 years ago might not work today, uh, what feels like it's a core part of our identity is really just a habit. It's an illusion. It's something that we're free to adopt or discard as we see fit. I mean, we're really the architect. Maybe that's what it comes down to, that we're the architect of our life. We're creating this structure, this vessel that carries us through time. And it's got to be a sound vessel. It has to operate properly. It has to be correctly designed and engineered. And if they're weak points or if they're failures, we just have to be ruthless. And we have to be ruthless in hunting them out. I think you said be you got to be kind of a, a mercenary. It's a guerrilla warfare approach uh, where... You're not worried about the overarching strategy or some elegant solution. You're just going and you're systematically checking out the different parts of your life and saying, is what I'm doing working? If not, let me find a better model. I'm not going to wait for the perfect solution, but I am going to get something that works, that gets me from point A to point B. I'm going to suppress the ego so that I don't maintain attachments to things that no longer serve me. I'm going to be aware. I'm going to be present so I can see what's actually going on. And then once I have that clarity, I've got some ritual for burying the dead. So I've got some way to move forward to put this behind me. Maybe I can go and gorge on ice cream for three days straight and get it out of my system and then put it behind me and move on to something better. Uh, or I can spend three hours on Tinder one day uh, hoping that I'm going to find a relationship. And when that doesn't work, I can move on dead and buried and get on to something that that actually serves my interests. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a critical skill set. I mean, it's something that it, just through habit, through condition, through identity, uh, all of us have certain ideas that are a representation of reality. And a lot of times those feel profound. They can feel profound because they become part of ourselves. They can feel profound, frankly, Z, because we just hear them so often. And the more often you hear something, the more you see someone else doing it, the more real it becomes. But I think we also, or we always need to remember that we're the ones in charge. And we just need that, that discipline to be the dispassionate observer, look at things objectively, and create a set of ideas that works for us in our situation. Because uh, if we're following along, as we've been talking about, if we're doing what everyone else is doing, we're following a failed narrative, a failed strategy, and we're going to end up in a pretty bad place. And Vin, I would say, too, we have to exercise that ability. So I was looking at different situations in, in, uh, with, that people have societally and in, in, in contemporary media. And I was thinking about there was flooding somewhere, and there was a tragic story here in L.A. where there was some flooding, and a woman tried to go through a flooded area in her car. The waters rose. She had her little boy in the car. The water was up to the windows, and... She got the little boy out. They were stuck. The car had went into hydrolock when, when you submerge the engine. And she's trying to get in there. The water's going. The rain's coming. And she pulls her little boy out of the car, and she loses her child. He gets washed away. I don't know if they found his body yet. And it's devastating. You want to learn from those experiences. You want to learn from those experiences. How do you keep yourself from harm's way? Just simply observe the weather. Is it worth it? Sometimes it's not worth it. If you were to just do a, a, a Buddhist type meditation and imagine you're sitting there, you're in your office in New York and there's a, a catastrophic earthquake, storm, something and all communication is shut off. Let's put ourselves there. We're going to be you for a minute, Vin, and we're in New York City um, and there's a huge... Um, natural disaster or some uh, terrorist thing, whatever, you know, maybe the, 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 the people who attacked the, the Capitol or whatever are now attacking New York and something blows up, right? What's the first thing you want to do? You want to first triage your family. Is that right? Yeah. The yeah, first right. thing you're going to do is hump it down. How many blocks? How many miles? What's about three miles? You're going to hump it. You're going to hump it home. Then you're going to walk over rubble and you're going to see all sorts of people that need your help. But what's on your mind? I'm going to get to the girls, get to my wife. I'm going to assess. 
your heart's going to be racing, your stomach's going to be churning, I got to get there. You get there, uh, hopefully everybody's okay. The next thing is, whatever world you knew before is gone, but you have the world that's the most important thing to you, you have it. And now you're going to get them in a place that's safe. Then sustain them, and the last thing you're going to seek is comfort. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. The problem is we, we have trained ourselves for the first thing we do is seek comfort. So under comfort, everything is a disaster. Because no matter how much comfort you get, you don't have enough. So we've trained ourselves to be comfort-seeking. Not to value what's most important. And then taking that value and then nurturing that value, comfort is last. That's messed up, isn't it? But we have it bass backwards. We're always seeking comfort. More comfort. Is it easy? Does it taste just to my liking? Is it just the right temperature? And that's training us in a way that invites disaster and, and, and longer seasons of grieving in our life. So let us be wise enough to take stock of what we have, do a triage of what we have. And it's oftentimes within arm's reach. Nurture, secure that first. Then move forward. Now as we navigate this world, apply that to everything we're doing. And we'll be much better off. You follow me, Vin? Yeah, yeah, I follow you, Z. Crystal clear. So we got it. We, we got, got the strategy. It. Got the playbook. That's it. Let's wrap it up. If you enjoyed the show, please consider leaving us a review on Podbean, iTunes, or your favorite podcasting app. Each five-star review helps us bring you more unique and insightful content. Learn more at dharmamedia.com. Peace. Peace.